before we actually look inside, can you tell me about some of the medications you've been trying? Your learning objectives for mastering the examination of the nose, mouth, and neck are to identify key anatomic structures of the nose, mouth, and neck, to master examination techniques for the nose, mouth, and pharynx and neck, including the thyroid gland and lymph nodes, and to assess common abnormalities such as pharyngitis and changes in the thyroid gland. Let's review the anatomy of the nose. Approximately the upper third of the nose is supported by bone, the lower two-thirds by cartilage. Note the bridge of the nose, the tip, and the ala nasi. Air enters the nasal cavity by way of the anterior nares, passing on either side through widened areas known as the vestibules. The nasal septum forms the medial wall of each nasal passage. Like the external nose, the nasal septum is supported by both bone and cartilage. The medial wall is covered by a mucous membrane well supplied with blood. The vestibule, unlike the rest of the nasal cavity, is lined with hair-bearing skin rather than mucosa. Air enters through the vestibules and through the narrow nasal passages to the nasopharynx. Protruding into the nasal cavity are the turbinates, curving bony structures covered by a highly vascular mucous membrane. Below each turbinate is a groove, or meatus, each named according to the turbinate above it. Draining into the inferior meatus is the nasolacrimal duct. Into the middle meatus drain most of the paranasal sinuses. Their openings are not usually visible. The paranasal sinuses are air-filled cavities located within the bones of the skull and lined with mucous membrane. Only the frontal sinus and the maxillary sinus are readily accessible to clinical examination. Common or concerning symptoms relating to the nose, mouth, and neck include nosebleed or epistaxis, sore throat, hoarseness, swollen glands, and goiter. Before you start your examination, make sure the examination equipment is within easy reach, including otoscope, tongue blades, and gloves. With the patient's health history in mind, and after good hand hygiene, you are ready for the physical examination. Begin by inspecting the anterior and inferior surfaces of the nose. Note asymmetry or deformity. Some asymmetry of the two sides is normal. Test for obstruction by pressing on each ala nasi in turn and asking the patient to breathe in. Breathe in gently for me. Then, tilt the head back, press gently on the tip of the nose, and shine a light into the vestibule to get a partial view of each nasal vestibule. To inspect the inside of the nasal passages, use an otoscope with the largest cap or speculum available. Be sure to insert the speculum carefully, avoiding contact with the sensitive nasal septum. Hold the otoscope handle to one side to avoid the patient's chin and improve your mobility. Repeat this procedure on the opposite side of the nose. Note the color and condition of the nasal mucosa that covers the nasal septum and the middle and inferior turbinates. Normally, the nasal mucosa is redder than the oral mucosa and displays no swelling, exudates, or bleeding. Note any deviation, inflammation, or perforation of the nasal septum. Look for any abnormalities, such as polyps, seen in allergies, or ulcerations, associated with use of nasal cocaine. Discard or clean and disinfect all nasal and ear specula appropriately. Conclude your examination of the nose by palpating for sinus tenderness. Press on the frontal sinuses from under the bony brows, avoiding pressure on the eyes then press up on the maxillary sinuses. Before examining the mouth, let's review the anatomy. The lips are muscular folds surrounding the entrance to the mouth. When the mouth is open, the gums, or gingival mucosa, and teeth become visible. 
The gingiva are firmly attached to the teeth and to the maxilla or mandible in which they are seated. Note the scalloped shape of the gingival margins and the pointed interdental papillae. In lighter-skinned people, the gingiva are pale or coral pink and lightly stippled. In darker-skinned people, the gingiva may be diffusely or partly brown. A midline mucosal fold, called a labial frenulum, connects each lip with the gingiva. Adjacent to the gingiva is the alveolar mucosa, which merges with the labial mucosa of the lip. Each tooth, composed chiefly of dentin, lies rooted in a bony socket with only its enamel-covered crown exposed. A shallow gingival sulcus between the gum's thin margin and each tooth is not readily visible. Small blood vessels and nerves enter the tooth through its apex and pass into the pulp canal and pulp chamber. The dorsum of the tongue is covered with papillae, giving it a rough surface. Some of these papillae look like red dots, which contrast with the thin white coat that often covers the tongue. The undersurface of the tongue has no papillae. Note the midline lingual frenulum that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. At the base of the tongue, the ducts of the submandibular gland, known as Wharton's ducts, pass forward and medially. They open on papillae that lie on each side of the lingual frenulum. Each parotid duct, or Stenson's duct, empties into the mouth near the upper second molar, where a small papilla frequently marks its location. The buccal mucosa lines the cheek. Above and behind the tongue rises an arch formed by the anterior and posterior pillars, soft palate and uvula. Between the pillars on both sides of the mouth, tonsils can be seen in their fossae, or cavities. In adults, the tonsils are often small or absent. Between the soft palate and tongue, the pharynx is visible. The hard palate forms the roof of the mouth. Before examining the mouth, ask the patient to remove any lipstick or dentures. Wearing gloves, inspect the outer surfaces of the lips for symmetry, color, and moisture. Note any lumps, ulcers, cracking, or scaling. I'm just going to look inside your mouth. Have you can open wide? With good lighting, and the help of a tongue blade, inspect the oral mucosa for color and ulcers, which can be seen in herpes simplex, white patches, suggesting candida infection, and nodules. Note the color of the gums. Inspect the gum margins and the interdental papillae for swelling or ulceration. Also inspect the teeth, noting any that are missing, discolored, misshapen, or abnormally positioned. Untreated caries can lead to bacteremia and endocarditis. With your gloved thumb and index finger, check for any teeth that might be loose and lead to risk of aspiration, especially in older adults. Next, inspect the color and architecture of the hard palate. Good, and can you just give me a big ah? Uh... Uh... As the patient says ah, or yawns, note the movement of the soft palate and uvula. The soft palate should rise symmetrically, and the uvula should stay in the midline. If the patient's tongue obstructs your view, use your tongue blade to depress it, but not so far that you cause gagging. Inspect the anterior and posterior pillars, tonsils if present, and pharynx. Look for redness, exudates, or ulceration. None should be present. Fever, anterior exudates, cervical lymphadenopathy, and no cough are highly suspicious of streptococcal pharyngitis. If you can open your mouth and stick your tongue right at me. Good. Continue by inspecting the tongue. Note its symmetry and color. Inspect its dorsal surface, which is normally roughened by papillae and sometimes covered by a thin white coating. Using a gauze square, use your right gloved hand to grasp the tip of the tongue and gently pull it to the patient's left to inspect the undersurface and sides of the tongue. Look for white or reddened areas, nodules, or ulcers. Palpate the tongue with your left gloved hand 
feeling for any in duration. Reverse the process for the other side. Before we examine the neck, let's look at the pertinent structures. For descriptive purposes, each side of the neck is divided into two triangles by the sternomastoid muscle. The anterior triangle is bounded above by the mandible, laterally by the sternomastoid, and medially by the midline of the neck. The posterior triangle extends from the sternomastoid to the trapezius and is bounded below by the clavicle. A portion of the omohyoid muscle crosses the lower portion of the posterior triangle. Inexperienced examiners may mistake the omohyoid muscle for a lymph node or mass. Deep to the sternomastoids run the great vessels of the neck, the carotid artery, and the external jugular vein, which passes diagonally over the surface of the sternomastoid and may be helpful when trying to identify the jugular venous pressure. Familiarity with the following midline structures is key to a successful examination. The mobile hyoid bone lies just below the mandible. The thyroid cartilage is readily identified by the notch on its superior edge. The cricoid cartilage, the tracheal rings, and the thyroid gland are also prominent structures. The thyroid isthmus lies across the trachea below the cricoid. The lymph nodes of the head and neck are classified in a variety of ways. The overlying sternomastoid muscle largely obscures the deep cervical chain, but at its two extremes, the tonsillar node and supraclavicular nodes may be palpable. The submandibular nodes lie superficial to the submandibular gland. Note that the tonsillar, submandibular, and submental nodes drain portions of the mouth and throat as well as the face. Knowledge of the lymphatic system is important to sound clinical examination. Whenever a malignant or inflammatory lesion is observed, look for enlargement of the nearby regional lymph nodes that drain it. Whenever a node is enlarged or tender, look for a nearby source of infection. To begin the examination of the neck, Inspect for symmetry while standing in front of the patient and note any masses or scars, for example, from a thyroidectomy or carotid endarterectomy. Look for enlargement of the parotid or submandibular glands and note any visible lymph nodes. Palpate the lymph nodes. Using the pads of your index and middle fingers, move the skin over the underlying tissues in each area. The patient should be relaxed with the neck flexed slightly forward and, if needed, turned slightly toward the side being examined. Palpate the anterior superficial and deep cervical chains, including the supraclavicular nodes located anterior and superficial to the sternomastoid. Note the node's size, shape, delimitation, mobility, consistency, and any tenderness. Small, mobile, discrete, non-tender nodes, sometimes termed shoddy, are found in normal people. Feel for the preauricular, posterior auricular, occipital, tonsillar, submandibular, submental, superficial cervical and posterior cervical nodes. Palpate the posterior cervical chain along the anterior edge of the trapezius and along the posterior edge of the sternomastoid. Sore throat, palatal petechiae, and posterior adenopathy suggest mononucleosis. Enlarged or tender nodes call for re-examination of the regions they drain and careful assessment of lymph nodes elsewhere. Now inspect and palpate the trachea for deviation. Place your finger along one side of the trachea and note the space between it and the sternomastoid. When compared to the other side, the spaces should be symmetric. Next, start the examination of the thyroid by inspecting the patient's neck. Tip the patient's head back a bit 
and inspect the region below the cricoid cartilage for the gland. With tangential lighting, you should be able to see the lower shadowed border of the thyroid glands. Ask the patient to extend her neck back slightly again as she sips some water and swallows. Observe for upward movement of the thyroid gland, noting its contour and symmetry, often a butterfly shape. The thyroid gland, the thyroid cartilage, and the cricoid cartilage all rise with swallowing, then fall to their resting positions. Confirm your visual observations by palpating the thyroid gland. First, locate the isthmus, usually overlying the second through fourth tracheal rings. Palpate the adjacent right and left lobes as you stand facing the patient. Look for goiter or enlargement of these lobes. Now move behind the patient and place the fingers of both hands on the patient's neck so that your index fingers are just below the cricoid cartilage. Again, ask the patient to take a sip of water and then to swallow it. Feel for the thyroid isthmus rising under your finger pads. Displace the trachea to the right with the fingers of the left hand. With the right hand fingers, palpate laterally for the right lobe of the thyroid in the space between the displaced trachea and the relaxed sternomastoid. Find the lateral margin. In a similar fashion, examine the left lobe. Note the size, shape, and consistency of the thyroid gland and identify any nodules or tenderness. If the thyroid gland is enlarged, listen over the lateral lobes with a stethoscope to detect a bruit, a sound similar to a cardiac murmur, but of a non-cardiac origin seen in thyrotoxicosis. Remember that a clear, well-organized clinical record, employing language that is neutral, professional, and succinct, is one of the most important adjuncts to patient care. Nose, nasal mucosa is pink, septum midline, no sinus tenderness. Mouth, oral mucosa is pink, no caries, dentition is good. Posterior pharynx without exudate. After practice and further review of this video, make sure you have mastered the important learning objectives for examining the patient's nose, mouth, and neck. Thank you.